Welcome to Learn From the Experts, presented to you by the Women Business Owners Alliance of Pioneer Valley. I'm Susan Allen from Susan Allen Financial, and my co-host is... Good afternoon. This is Ida Tassinari from Real Living Real Estate. My job is to help you find your path home, and today we're here with... Hi, I'm Christine Tatro. I'm the owner of Locus Digital Forensic Solutions in Springfield. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit about your business, Christine? What do you what do you do? <laughs> sure. Uh, very simply put, I extract data from uh, s mostly cell phones and mobile devices, and I analyze that data once it's extracted from the device. Now, most of your clients are they corporate or uh, attorneys in a divorce matter, or where would your services be used most of the time? They could be at any of those uh, locations. My uh, primary uh, clients would be attorneys uh, from any walk of uh, or any path of mm -hmm. the practice of law. Um, it is useful in uh, divorce. It's also useful in criminal cases and occasionally even in uh, situations of wills and trusts. It is uh, common in um, uh, business, uh, so hmm. corporate law, and and also uh, corporate businesses, uh, particularly those that are concerned about uh, corporate espionage. Mm -hmm. Wow! Now, how did you get into this? Oddly enough, I got into this after um, over 17 years as a prosecutor. I took a position with the Northwestern District Attorney's Office as the director of the Child Sexual Predator Project there. Oh wow! And uh, the main focus of that grant was uh, child, uh, excuse me, technology facilitated crimes against children. Mm -hmm. So child pornography, child mm -hmm. enticement, uh, that type of thing. And so in order to uh, be able to adequately prosecute those cases, I needed to learn uh, about the technology and about how it is used uh, in those types of crimes. And so I began taking courses uh, through the National White Collar Crime Bureau through the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force mm -hmm. um, and a number of other uh, places and uh, began with desktop computers uh, because those were desktops and laptops were the primary uh, sources of our uh, information at that time. Uh, in the few years since I have started in this field, it has moved over primarily to um, mo mobile devices, cell okay. phones, mm -hmm. tablets, and uh, the like. Now yeah. what are some things that people would be surprised to know about as far as their phones and privacy and safety? What are some things that you find that are common themes that we don't know about but well, we should? <laughs> one, of, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't know about and, uh, and I explain this to parents when I do internet safety is that what we consider smartphones today, we call them cell phones, they're really not phones anymore. Mm -hmm. They're really computers and not little computers either. They have more computing power than the computers that were used to land humanity on the moon. Wow. So that is something that a lot of people don't realize. And so uh, both we as adults and our children when we give them these uh, devices are actually carrying around a tremendous amount of computing power and that's something that I think everyone needs to be aware of. Um, it's almost like you're carrying around your laptop and your desktop in your pocket mm -hmm. um, and so for privacy and safety purposes we need to be very aware of what we're doing uh, with our phones. Now uh, Facebook is very popular and all of the other social mm -hmm. media uh, areas that you can look into. How many of the employers will use Facebook to research or s ask you to do any research for future employees? Uh, that would not be something that would be within my okay. uh, wheelhouse. Um, but from what I have learned doing research to do my presentations, I have found that a lot of uh, employers and colleges have taken up uh, looking at uh, social media. Um, just all you could have to do is Google a person to find out what their social media platforms are if they don't set their privacy settings uh, just right. And you can learn a great deal about a person um, and that is one of the things that I always warn students about is mm -hmm. that uh, when they're looking for college or they're looking for work that they need to think about their digital footprint and what are they leaving behind. Exactly. 
Now also, just, excuse me, just That's recently fine. there was um, something in the news about the new technology in these toys mm -hmm. that somehow the toys can then be tracking some information about your child. I'm not sure if it was a doll or the games that they can actually track that more information about the, the, the individual. Well, basically anything that can access the internet can uh, have the potential to track whoever is using that device, mm -hmm. uh, depending, on, depending on what kind of software is, is placed into that. So it could theoretically be a doll. I haven't heard about that. Um, I do have some experience with um, the video games that are now primarily online. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something that a lot of parents did not realize when they were started giving their children the upgraded versions of Xbox and mm -hmm. PlayStation and things like that. They thought they were just getting the most current version and didn't realize that then their child is going on the internet and actually having either text conversations or even voice conversations with people that they might not know. And, uh, and I have prosecuted uh, and investigated cases wow. where uh, predators have reached out to um, young people uh, who are playing these games in order to um, in order to make contact, and sometimes that has had some very unfortunate uh, mm -hmm. experiences for the kids. And, I'm sorry, that's now, can people um, track you by your phone? Like, can they know where you're located, or how does? How does that work? Again, that depends on what apps you have on your phone okay. and how you set your privacy within those apps. And that's something that I mention at almost every presentation that I do is um, if you, for instance, take a photograph or a video with your phone, mm -hmm. um, unless you have turned off your location services for that particular app, whatever you're using to take the photos, um, it is uh, that when you take that photograph, it is creating what's known as EXIF data, um, in, and that's spelled E-X-I-F. And uh, within the photograph itself, uh, this is metadata. It tells the device that it was taken on. Wow. And the other thing it can tell, among other uh, things, is the latitude and longitude where the photograph was taken. Wow. And uh, so then if you post it to your social media and you haven't stripped the metadata, off of it, then you end up uh, putting out there exactly where you were when you took that picture. And so for most people, that might not be a problem. But if, for instance, you took a picture of your child at their field day at school, and then you posted that on Facebook, with two simple free uh, software programs that can be easily downloaded uh, from the internet, uh, a predator could uh, take the metadata off of that photograph, put it into another um, another program mm -hmm. that would tell where exactly where that latitude and longitude was, and know exactly where that child goes to school. Yeah. And so, um, when we go into schools, we always advise parents to turn off the location services um, on their phone when mm -hmm. they're ta when they're taking photos and videos. Same thing with Instagram. Um, and that's a little bit more of a, an issue for young people. Mm -hmm. Maybe they want to post where they took this particular picture. Or I was speaking with a manicurist who said, you know, sometimes with Instagram, she will want to take a picture of something that she's done and post that this picture was taken at her salon. Right. And that's a perfectly legitimate use for it. Um, so she ends up having to turn location services on and off. Okay. Uh, in order to do that, because she doesn't want everything that she does to be, to, uh, be to be known. Right. Exactly. Now, as a parent, the whole internet and safety mm -hmm. and playing the games, that's such a um, frightening subject. And how, what is the first age? Or what, do you have any guidelines when a parent maybe comes to you and says, should I get my child a cell phone? And is there an age, or what is the group of children that you speak to at the schools Well, talk about digital safety? Well, I'll talk to parents of uh, children of any age. Um, and uh, I actually like to start younger. Um, what I ask parents when they ask me that question is, what is your purpose in getting a phone for your child? And usually they will say, 
Um, you know, I want to be able to reach them whenever, and I want them to be able to call me in case of an emergency. Well, in that case, you don't need a smartphone. All you need is a flip phone for, for that. That child does not need a smartphone. Um, and um, as they get older and they show more maturity and more responsibility and you're able to talk with them about safety and as they get more abstract reasoning um, where they can understand the concepts, um, then as a parent you need to make that determination whether your child is mature enough for this or not. Um, the next thing that I tell parents is um, that there should be a general rule that if I don't understand the device, you don't get it. Parents need to understand what the devices are doing that their children um, are using. And I've made this mistake myself uh, back in the days before I knew uh, all of this. Um, I got my grandson uh, a new uh, handheld game device. and. Mm -hmm. I thought, again, that I was just getting him the most recent version. And then a short time later, I saw a couple of boys playing a game. They were clearly playing against each other, but they were not connected by any wires. And I asked them, how are you doing that? And they said, oh, well, you know, we're using Wi-Fi. Right. Okay. And they were using the same device that my grandson was. And I did some more research and discovered that I had given him something that would connect to the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, and he knew it. And I but didn't. You didn't. Okay. And he was six, mm -hmm. so <laughs> so that's a little scary. Yes. So now I always tell parents uh, that they should do research, and um, the best way to do that is to go to one of the places that sells these devices, whether it is uh, your phone carrier mm -hmm. um, or a store that specializes in this. Not you know not just your general department store where the person behind the counter in the phone department today is in linens tomorrow. You want someone who is able to tell you uh, exactly what this phone is capable of. Now, also, if you were to sell your phone back in some stores, they'll have a kiosk where they can recycle the phones. Mm -hmm. It must be very important to make sure that your data is not being transferred yes. with that phone. It is. So how would you prevent the data being transferred? You would, you would want to uh, wipe everything back to factory settings. And you can do that yourself. You can Google it for your particular model, or you can take it into the store. Uh, if you were trading it in, for instance, and ask the, uh, the clerk there to please set it back to factory settings, mm -hmm. and then double check that your information is not on there before you donate it to a kiosk or before you sell it back on any of these online. So if you have a preteen at home, is there any kind of an app or any kind of a device that you could prevent them from transferring any inappropriate photos? <laughs> um, and prevent them from doing it? Uh, po possibly. Uh, there are a number of uh, parental control apps that are out there. Um, a lot of them by subscription, some of them that you load directly onto the phone, but there are a lot that are by subscription. Um, and that's the next thing that I recommend to parents is parental controls on all of the internet devices that your children use. Um, there are a number of them out there. There are a lot that are free, and uh, there are others that you pay a small monthly or annual fee uh, in order to do this. And there are different levels of um, supervision that you mm -hmm. can give. Some of them have uh, your real-time GPS tracking, so you can also know where your child is, mm -hmm. um, you know, which can be handy if your child has to walk home from school or something and you're concerned about their well-being. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. you know, l all different types of uh, levels of supervision. So it's really up to the parent you know, what you want to do. I strongly recommend that parents block uh, children from being able to download apps on their own without parental permission. Okay. Um, and most of the apps will, most of the uh, parental control apps will do that. And what's an app vault? An app vault is um, basically a place where you can hide stuff you don't want people to see. Ooh, and your parents. Like your parents. <laughs> or teachers. Now, <laughs> when, when we talk adults. about these things, when, when we talk about these things, most of them have legitimate uses in some way, but they can be transferred to uh, a use that is not safe, particularly for young people. Mm -hmm. um, 
And app vaults do have a very legitimate uh, role. For instance, if you have your um, banking on your phone, you might want to have those apps inside your app vault so that it doesn't show on your phone that you have those. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And then only if you get into the vault yourself can you uh, actually um, access your data. So there's a legitimate purpose for it. Um, but then there are also other purposes. It's uh, the most common use for an app vault these days, unfortunately, is sexting. That's mm -hmm. where people keep pictures that they take and send or that they receive. Um, and that is, uh, statistically speaking, the most common. Um, and kids might use an app vault uh, to store apps that their parents don't want them to use. And that is why I strongly suggest starting from the beginning before you get the child the device that you have a conversation with the child that you then put parental controls on. I always recommend that this is done in conversation with your child, not secretly, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that does not promote trust. And you want, to exp you want to make sure that the child understands that it's not them you don't trust, it's the people that might harm them. Mm -hmm. um, but that it should be on there, the kids know that it's on there. Um, and that um, you know they and that they know what it does, and that would prevent them from downloading the app vault in the first place, and then you wouldn't Doing have to that. worry about that. What about it, when we do the banking on our cell phones now? Does anything um, help as far as like you know the, the phones that use the thumbprint? You know, to you have to use mm -hmm. your thumbprint to get in. Does that offer you protection, or that's a whole different? You know what I'm talking about? Like it's a lot of the phones, you have to. Right. No one can get in except your own thumbprint. Right. Um, well, those phones also have the code that you can punch in, and right. most of them, when you um, have charged it or turned it off and turned it back on, you have to use the code. Okay. So uh, it so it doesn't really prevent somebody else from using it if they know your code. Correct. So it's not extra protection. It's re that was really put in there for ease of the owner being able to get into their phone without having to punch in uh, the app. So that's not really a protective thing. It's not, okay. Um, no, um, but there are a number of ways that you can protect your phone, um, which leads me to another topic, which is malware, um, yeah. which is something a lot of people are concerned about. It's been in the news a lot lately. Um, and uh, so, First of all, just to talk about some symptoms of malware so that folks will know. Um, mm -hmm. the, most common, the most common way that people find out that they have been hacked is that they get their bill and they find unauthorized charges on it. Um, and unfortunately, by then, it's, it's a little too late. You've been hacked and your information may have been compromised. Um, another way that you might notice is if apps are randomly opening and closing on mm -hmm. your phone then uh, that might mean, um, that typically means that there's some malware that is opening mm -hmm. and closing your apps. So that's, that's a way that you can notice before getting your bill. If your battery life is going down very quickly, because yeah, malware happens. operates constantly in the background, so naturally it's draining your battery. Oh, so that's another yeah. way to recognize it. Or if your phone gets very hot, if you're talking on the phone mm -hmm. and you notice that it's very hot in the back, again, from overuse of the battery. So wow. those, are, uh, those are signs of that. Um, and uh, as far as protecting yourself from malware, uh, one of the easy ways is to get an iPhone. And I'm not saying that to sell iPhones, but at this point there are no known malware um, that have infected iPhones. Um, oh, I'm sure that at some point that set. will happen, <laughs> but at this point there's no known malware that affects iPhones. Androids are more vulnerable because um, Androids have what's known as an open ecosystem. So there are, one of the reasons people like Androids is because you can get so many more apps, but the apps are not vetted the way that they are through Apple. Okay, um, so that's, that's one way. Um, use only vetted apps. If you do have an Android, and there are lots of good reasons to have an Android, um, try to get your apps only through Google Play. Do not use third-party um, sellers uh, of apps. If it's in Google Play, they're <coughs> getting better about doing the vetting. Um, and there also is, uh, there also are apps similar to your antivirus protection on your computer. So that would be another thing that you could do. Those are ways you can actually protect 
the data that's on your phone and your wow. private information. Do you have a particular um, program or product that you recommend more than others for your protection online? I'm partial to Symantec, but that's just because I like their product generally. Mm -hmm. But now, but there are lots out there that are um, that are really good. As a consumer using online banking mm -hmm. and purchasing power, I know there's the sign of the uh, padlock that shows that this is a, a secure sign mm -hmm. uh, site. But as a consumer, if the government and and big corporations mm -hmm. are being hacked, are we really safe? No. <laughs> you want the short answer. Thank you. Nobody is completely safe. All you can do mm -hmm. is do your best. I tell people, you know, don't run and hide from it. You can't run and hide from it. Just be smart about how you use this mm -hmm. really valuable tool. Wow. Now also, in the colleges, um, in high schools, are they getting into more of this forensic uh, social media to get more people trained like yourself to be able to um, do this type of investigating? I don't know that it's happening in high schools, uh, but colleges, particularly with criminal justice and computer science okay, programs, yes. um, are starting to teach this. In fact, um, I will be starting teaching uh, n in a couple of weeks at Western New England University oh, great. computer mm -hmm. crime scene investigation, which is one of the courses that they offer to both computer science and criminal justice majors. Um, and I know that there are other uh, courses that they offer as well within the computer science uh, department mm -hmm. that are, you know, p teach them particular tools that they can use for this type of thing. Well, thank you very so, much thank for you. coming here today. And thank you, Ida. And if you'd like to find out more information about Christine or any of the other topics we've discussed in the past, please go to WBOA.org.